Oh, God. Jesus Christ. Oh, sh Too close. No, she's under me. Now I'm over her. Get out of here! Get out of here! Oh, and this never gets old. <laughs>Welcome to Oddball. That's right, I'm Amino Hassan. That right there is Charlotte Wilder. Back to the old Genie Bus basketball background. And we've got a hell of a show for you today. Uh, that's right, a little bit later, we're going to be trudging the gutter that is NBA Reddit to find us a topic to inspire us. But right now, Charlotte, the entire basketball world is talking about the in-depth expose article feature that Ramona Shelburne wrote for ESPN.com about what's happening behind the scenes with James Harden and the Philadelphia 76ers, where the friction lies, how this all came to be a friction situation. Charlotte, what was the thing that jumped out at you the most in that article? Um, probably the fact, first of all, I would like to thank James Harden because this is still the off season, which is why we're going to have to go to NBA Reddit. Uh, hold but. on. Hold on. Let me, I'm going to stop you right there. Technically, James Harden ain't do nothing new. This time we got to thank Ramona. Ramona's the one who, who gave us this little yes. bridge right here because this is all based on past events. This is not breaking news. So oh, that, no, no, no. This is I actual know. journalism, I, I'm, I'm ladies grateful. and gentlemen. I, I, let me I, let me get on a soapbox for a second. Like this is what journalism looks like. It's not so and so got traded. Like that stuff you would have found out anyway when you watched the game and you saw. Hey, when did he get there? This is actual journalism reporting, news breaking, where you're going in, you're finding the why, you're talking to people behind the scenes, you're getting motivations, you're getting stories that we had never heard or known of. So, thank you, Ramona, for being an actual thank journalist. You. Thank you, Ramona. Always thank you, Ramona. Just thank you, Ramona, in general. Um, also, though, thank you, James Harden, for being a little petty. I mean, I think to me, I mean, the thing that surprised me was that he picked up or or that alleged, you know, the Sixers are saying they were surprised that Harden picked up his option, that they right. were they were waiting and they were going to make an offer. And he got impatient and felt hurt and was, you know, all ego -y about it. And then demanded a trade. I mean, is that what, did that surprise you? So sometimes there are parts of a story that is well reported that you can kind of tell the angle of the source. Yes. Well, right. So in this in that specific case, I mean, I would say the overall article is very Sixers friendly, right? In that particular case, the case of hey, he picked the option up and we didn't even expect it. We didn't know what was going on. I'm calling a little BS on the Sixers here, and here's why. Because the whole thing was James Harden was calling Daryl Morey. Daryl Morey wasn't responding because he was afraid of getting hit with tampering charges uh, based on basically what happened to him the year before, where they had been shown that they had been speaking to free agents before the beginning of the moratorium. And so they were illegal contact, and they got docked second-round picks as a result. I'm calling the horse hockey a little bit because you're not allowed to negotiate. That doesn't mean I can't say happy birthday. That doesn't mean right. I can't. To my player, by the way, my player who's on my roster who has not opted out yet, I'm allowed to say, hey, are you coming into the gym? You want to get some shots up? Uh, I'm allowed to contact him, and if it's specific, if he's like, yo, I'm trying to have small talk, and he's specifically asking me about contractual things, I'm allowed to tell him, James, I can't have that conversation with you right now. As you know, we've been in trouble for this in the past. So, right, you don't have to ghost him completely. Yeah, that's, that, that's, that's my thing. So that's kind of the explanation as to why they didn't get back to him, and that was the impetus, him being ghosted, was the impetus of him basically saying, okay, I'm opting in, trade me out of here. I mean, I think Ramona does, she did a great job of of putting in things that we can't fully know in terms of motivation and saying like, who knows? It could be that Harden, it could be an ego thing. It could be an ego thing for Maury. It right. could also be, I mean, I, were you surprised at all that the 
the sort of partying in Miami and that's that what seemed to me like a small film thing right. in a film session where there was a little bit of a dust up. Did, did that surprise you that it's being I feel like I've seen so many headlines pulling it and being like partying film sessions a problem for Sixers. Like how much how much do you think that was actually a factor and how much do you think that was something the Sixers could point to and be like he was difficult? here? So so this is what I would say. It is not uncommon for NBA players in specific cities particularly when the calendar allows, to have days off and to not travel with the team as a result. I told a story on NBA radio uh, yesterday about when I worked for the Suns, and even after I worked for the Suns, you know, when, as a media member, there's the exit to the loading dock where the valet parking is for all the home players, and then that's where the buses are for the road team. And I can't count the number of times walking out after a game and here are the buses for the teams, and then there's a black SUV or a black Sprinter van waiting. And mm -hmm. that van is waiting for one, two, sometimes even three or four players from the visiting team who are not going to accompany the team on the, on the flight to the next destination. They're going to Vegas. They're going to Vegas. They're going to party. They're going to take a PJ to Vegas. They're going to party for the night, and then they're going to meet up with the team tomorrow. And they don't, don't have, obviously, tomorrow is going to be an off day or whatever. That happens all the time in the NBA. One of the most famous examples is uh, Phil Jackson sending Dennis Rodman to Vegas, basically, like we learned about in The Last Dance, that, you know, you need to clear his mind. It happens a lot. So that part is not surprising. I would say Harden, more than most star players, definitely takes full advantage of that. So what he's doing isn't rare, but also, like, he's definitely a league leader uh, particularly given the circumstance. The circumstance was they lost to the Heat, they lost to the Celtics, and these are two Eastern Conference rivals, and people feeling like, hey, we're not all on the same page. we got to get locked in now. And he's like, yeah, but I got this trip to Miami. I'm not changing it. Right. And that rubbed right. people the wrong way. So that doesn't surprise me at all because, again, James, like I said, would have been a league leader in that regard. But I don't think it's out of the question, like, whoa, this out-of-control guy going out partying every night. You'd be surprised how many of your favorite players have done or do the same thing. The way Ramona presented it, too, felt sort of like death by a thousand cuts in this situation. Yeah. It felt like that, you know, Harden came in expecting one thing. Maybe his ego's a little bruised to begin with, and he's gotten these big offers from the Rockets, from the Nets, and he's like, no, no, I can, I, I still deserve this in his current role mm -hmm. um even though he hasn't i mean he's he's played he's an amazing player he's a generational player but in the playoffs he didn't really do much and well, so it seemed i mean i, I mean like the, he, they people say he didn't do much in game seven they wouldn't get to game I mean. seven if he if it wasn't for him that massive game one victory he had a big uh, i want to say game four or game five that's not fair of me to say but i think that that that's the narrative that's attached to him that's sure. why that's where my brain goes because i'm like oh well when it comes to the playoffs he he can't get it done which is probably not totally fair and maybe that contributed to the way he's feeling too well, I, I think i mean again i think the way he's feeling now is you called it death by a thousand cuts it starts all the way back at the beginning of the season where they say, hey, if we're going to win, we need you to play this way. And he's thinking to himself, wait, I took a pay cut yeah. so that you guys could bring in more talent. Like, I did, I did the good guy thing. So now you're asking me to play a style that's not going to produce the gaudy type of statistics or have me in the conversations uh, at this uh, elite level that I'm used to. But I'm doing that because it's all for the purpose of winning. As long as you guys know, I'm still that guy. Right. So I, I'm playing a role that you're asking me to do, but I'm still that guy. So I expect to be paid like that guy. And so he does all the things, but obviously there's the ups and downs and the bumps and bruises or whatever. And I think Ramona really makes it very clear that there was always that underlying tension of Daryl saying, I don't know if he's worth it anymore, and hard right. knowing that I bet they don't think I'm worth it anymore, but they all kind of let that to the side to kind of, oh, we're going to sacrifice to win, sacrifice to win, and by the end of it, he's expecting to be compensated. It's clear they're not going to compensate him, so he says, I don't want to be here anymore. Do you think 
that if that had been more explicit, because it doesn't sound like it was, it doesn't, and maybe, maybe it was, maybe, I mean, maybe there's a conversation where they made it more understood, but it felt to me like this simmering thing, no, this simmering Mm -hmm. element, element, elephant in the room that nobody talked about. And then all of a sudden this grows into this massive resentment. Do you think it could have made any difference if they had been more upfront with, in communication with each other. Do you, well, first of all, do you think the elephant was like simmering as in, oh, I'm mad, yeah. or simmering like it's in a big cauldron? I'm like, it's ah! in a big tub. It's in a big tub. We're it's like a, a lobster elephant pot tonight. for elephants. What do you think elephant tastes like? Ew, bad. A, a no. little tough. I mean, no, no. <laughs> you remember <laughs> it though, if you if you had it. I would, yeah. Because it never forgets. It stays in you. Oh, my God. Yeah. Um, so here, here's, here's, here's what I want to do. Here's what I'd, I'd say. Yes, communication is always key. And by the way, that's been a criticism throughout Daryl Morey's career, that he's not great at communication, that he's kind of yeah, communication apparently. with his players, right? Uh, right? And there have been multiple coaches and multiple players who have complained about that. Like, Daryl's kind of like, oh, I don't, that's not me. I'm the front office guy. And that's not really how the job works. You kind of have to be hands-on, particularly with your star players. Like, they're not about that, hey, I couldn't get back to you, life, because I don't want to get caught for tampering. Look, they want to do an investigation and, and clean out my phone and see all my communication with you was, I can't talk about this right now. They can do that, but I'm not right, going to be right. like, well, the league has said, so I'm never going to call you again until July 1, particularly because he's still under contract. Because until he opts out, he's still under contract. He's not a free agent. It's not tampering. It would be like saying, I couldn't talk to Joel Embiid because I don't want to hit with... No, he's not, he's not a free agent yet. So that's kind of horse hockey. On the other side of the equation, though, Harden clearly is temperamental and emotional. And the number one example that I'm surprised everyone isn't running with it. This is insane. He sacrifices. He's playing well. The Sixers are winning. He's not named as an all-star. He oh, gets that ups- was, this is insane. He gets upset because he feels like, again, I'm still that guy up here. But because of what you guys have asked me to do now, my standing in the league has has diminished greatly. A guy who's a 10-time consecutive all-star selection. Typically, we've seen it. Like, this thing is on autoplay until, like, you're done, until you're washed. So that hurt his feelings. But as there is always every year, there was an injury. So Adam Silver picks up the phone and says, James Harden, you're the injury replacement. You're the first person we called. Here's an all-star slot for you. We just need a commitment that you're free because sometimes guys are like, yo, I'm going, I'm getting married all-star weekend or whatever, and they, they just can't make it. So, hey, can you make it? Harden doesn't respond for days. Why? Because he's pouting. Yeah, uh, they're going to give me an injury replacement. I'm better than that. Blah, blah, blah. And by the time he gets his head out of his ass, and says, fine, I'll do it. Guess what? <laughs> the league moved on. They gave the spot to Pascal Siakam. That, to me, is insanity. But it, it gives a window, a window into, like, A, where his ego is or was, and B, oh, no wonder. If you're dealing with that kind of, that kind of self-image, where I am... The idea of responding to the commissioner of the league to accept an all-star berth is beneath me. Like it's some chick you talk to and like, oh, no, she she didn't say thank you as I held the door. I'm not hitting her back for five days. And then I'll be like, okay, I guess we could go out again. Let's, no, dude. you. This league has been around for 75 plus years. It's going to be around for 75 more. None of us matter. Not you, not me, not Charlotte. None of us matter. So the idea that his feelings would be that hurt, that kind of, is just, I cannot imagine what the day-to-day is in terms of trying to manage that. Totally. And I think that that anecdote is so crucial to the story, right? Because then when, when Maury isn't responding, it's sort of like, well, what got him to the point? I've had, you know, I feel like everybody's had friends where it's like, fool me once, fool me 15 times. You're like, at a certain point, you're like, I actually just can't respond to you because like, 
it's not going to get me anywhere, right. which is not the same thing as being in the NBA and dealing with superstars. But you can sort of see how someone could get pushed there, even if that is the Sixers line. So I don't know. I mean, I do. You, what happens now? Like what happens? I mean, I, I think the problem is, again, this would all be solved with more communication. Again, yeah. Ramona confirmed pretty much what we all suspected when we talk about on this show. Harden's comments in China were directly linked to the report that came out less than 48 hours earlier that said that Darren Moore is like, you know what, we're not trading him. Yeah. This all gets solved by communication. If you're in regular communication with your player, with your player's representation, and you have to be, right, a lot of these things get solved. They get fixed. Not all of them. Sometimes it's irreparable. Look, uh, Tom Thibodeau was in constant communication with Jimmy Butler in Minnesota. Yeah. But Jimmy yeah. had made his mind up, like, I don't want to be here. If you're not going to pay me this amount, but you're going to pay him, you're going to pay him, guess what? I don't want to be here. Right? Yeah. So even though Tibbs had been in communication with him all summer long, and it didn't matter. Like, Jimmy had made his mind up. This is a case where it feels like as much as it's high maintenance and it's like, I don't want to do this, that's the job, my man. You have to do this part of it. If for no other reason, not because, oh, we're going to retain him and I want to keep him forever, so I have to do this. But even if I'm trying to divest myself, I still have to do this part until he's out the door. And Daryl Morey failed in that regard, I think. And that's, to me, is one of the things, even though Ramona says in the story, for the time being, Embiid is happy with how everything is being handled. Like, that's all well and good because it's August or September. October, November, December, when things aren't working and we haven't fixed these issues, that becomes an issue, I think. That becomes a bigger problem, and people have reserve the right to change their mind. Like, yeah, I didn't mind it in the summer, but now it's fucking with my season, with yeah. my quest for a championship, with my quest for another MVP trophy. And when that happens, I love you, but I don't love you as much as I love me. And so... Also, you skipped my wedding. Yeah, well... I'm... What, did Daryl skip the wedding, too? On Bede's wedding? Yeah. Oh, God, I have to do another investigation. Yep, get back on the streets. Okay. Go, no more talking to deli owners, by the way. Get, find some actual sources. Be like Ramona okay. Shelburne, damn it. More Oddball, next. Oh, wow. All right, I mean, you might know what time it is. You might not know what time it is, but it is time for the game where we read each other things from NBA Reddit and talk about them and make up stuff no, based on that. No, and watch the other person react. You forgot the most important part of the segment, Charlotte. See, well, that's why you're here. Uh, I have one for you. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. If you could fuse any two players in NBA history to try and create the perfect player, who would they be? If I could fuse two players, oh, the perfect player. This is easy, like LeBron and Jordan, right? Game over. <laughs> like, right? no more arguments. No more ar Rich Paul, Stephen A. Smith, everybody, shut up. I got an answer for you. How about LeBron Jordan? I'm the best player in the world. Or Michael James? Michael James. We already had a, We had two Michael James who played in the NBA already. Mikey Jimmy? No, 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 no. No, LeBron Jordan. LeBron, actually, the, the real name was LeBriant Nash. Remember him? He played for uh, Oklahoma State back in the day. And I was like, wow, it's like they took Kobe, LeBron, and Steve Nash and made one player, and they called him LeBriant Nash. But no, LeBron Jordan, this is easy. Like, there's no other answer because if you take any, we, or I guess the other, oh, you know what? I stand corrected. Huh? What? Stephen O'Neal. Okay. This is why I want it. the person then goes on to say the one obvious one for me is Shaq and Steph Curry. Yeah. Now, now that I think about it, because if I had the inside dominance of Shaq and the outside dominance, like if you had to pick up Shaq 40 feet up because he's going to pull, right? Like he's going to pull I from mean, 40 feet. That's so dangerous. And he can dribble. By the way, Shaq could already dribble really well for a big guy, but like now you give him Steph Curry handles. Now he's getting around everybody, and then he gets to the paint and he dunks on everybody. He's great in the post. He's great on the block. He's great with floaters and mid-range and all this stuff. He can shoot threes. I don't know, man. Maybe, oh. Is it LeBron Jordan or, well, or is, it, is it Shaquille Curry? 
Well, here's a question. This is how you decided. I mean, would LeBron Jordan or Shaquille Curry, who would win in that one-on-one -on -one matchup? Well, in a one-on-one, -on -one, it would be Shaquille Curry because just the size. The size is too overwhelming. But So is that the answer? But, no, but I think LeBron, because here's the deal. Shaquille Curry still can't guard anybody. I mean, they can kind of <laughs> guard, like, guys on the inside. They'll do their best on the perimeter. I'm not saying that Shaq was a bad defensive player. I'm not saying Steph is a bad defensive player. But I'm saying neither of them are elite defensive players, right? Whereas LeBron Jordan, that guy's an elite defender. He's got the size of yeah. LeBron, which allows him to guard up. And he's got the feline quickness of, of MJ, so he, he can, you know, move laterally very quickly. He's very explosive, which, by the way, LeBron is as well. Like, I, I, I just, I still think LeBron Jordan is a better all-round player, but Shaquille Curry, man, that, that let, let me put it this way. You're going to have some headaches. Now, let me ask you, Charlotte, yes. if you had to go to a game, and I gave you two tickets. One game is to go watch Shaquille Curry, and one is to watch LeBron Jordan. Which guy are you watching? Oh, my God. I think I think LeBron Jordan. I think LeBron Jordan because I that debate is so ingrained in my head that I'd be like, okay, let's see what – because no one's like, who's better, Shaq or Steph, I don't think. Is that – you well, know, it's MJ LeBron. Yeah, no, no. I would want – I would want to see that. I would want to see like, okay, when you take the two guys that people talk about the most as being maybe the greatest or maybe the other one's the greatest or whatever you want to do with that stupid argument. Well, let's see what they do together. I would also like to see what that personality would be like. I would like to see what LeBron Jordan, how that person acts as a human being, because I, I can't even imagine how you begin to fuse those two people. Well, see, here, here's the deal for me. While I think LeBron Jordan is still the better player, I think Shaquille Curry is just way better entertainment. This is what I'd want to watch, right? That's, and so that's true. If I were to go, I was like, you gave me the option. I would hop on the Game Time app. I would be like, when is Shaquille Curry coming to my town? And then whatever the price is, I would go in there and I would type promo code DLS. I would get twenty dollars off whatever the price is. It's a hundred dollar ticket. I'm paying eighty. It's a two hundred dollar ticket. I'm paying one hundred and eighty. I'm going down to the arena. I'm letting people know, hey, hey, how'd you get your seat? I got these great seats on the Game Time app. Terms do apply. And I'm watching Shaquille Curry devastate people on the inside and then humble them and put them in morbid fear on the outside. That's what I would do. But, you know, try okay. to get your LeBron. LeBron Jordan sounds like he'd be boring. He'd be, like, I mean, like, exciting to play, but like a boring uh. personality. Shaquille Curry? Well, hold on. Shaquille Curry, because I mean, Shaq is carrying I don't the personality so. I mean, load on that one, right? Like we're not looking for 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 Steph. But now here, here's the crazy thing. What? Which documentary would you want to watch more, Shaquille Curry oh. or LeBron Jordan? Is LeBron it? Would you Jordan. rather watch more than The Last Dance, or would you rather watch Shaqton and Underdog? I want to see. I want to see Michael Jordan's pettiness. Combined with LeBron's corniness. Oh, I thought you were going to say combined what? with LeBron's passive aggressiveness. Yeah, well, same. I mean, it all goes hand in hand. I think that would be an absolute nightmare of a person. And I would like to see those interviews. Yeah, I, I, I think I agree with you. I think the passive aggression combined with the pettiness makes for a better Come on. thing. Here's, here's the one thing where Shaq and Steph Curry have something in common. Completely horseshit documentaries. Where it's like, yeah. and then against all <laughs> odds, I succeed. Like, against all odds? What are you talking about? You're 7'1, 300 pounds with a 40 inch vertical. You're the son of a pro athlete who lives as a millionaire's life all around NBA. What are you guys talking about? Like, I for sure, I'd rather just have like someone reveal to me how much they hated every single person that they played with or like were Absolutely. married to or, or sired or whatever. I'd rather have that than, than that shit. I want every single receipt. I also think Shaquille Curry is definitely the name choice because Steph O'Neal sounds like someone I went to high school with in Boston. Was she a redhead? Yeah, probably. Yeah. That was... Shout out Brian Scalabrini. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, I'm, I'm imagining Brian Scalabrini with like a long wig. I know you but, are. That's but I know. Same, same voice and same face and everything. Even like same facial scruff. Steph O'Neal. Ponytail. I got to tell you. That's going to do it for that segment where we read things off of NBA Reddit and watch the other person react.
That's how you do it. Okay, all right, cool. That's all the oddball we have for you today. Thanks for watching. Are we having fun yet? Wasn't that a Miller Lite commercial? <laughs>